Philippians 3. Well, Philippians chapter 2, the mind of Christ. And I want to share with you in the way of introduction, I want to begin our time together in God's life chant changing, life-transforming word, to say that Jesus and I are by nature opposites. I'll explain what I mean by that, and I think you'll find the same is true for you. He's holy. I'm sinful. He's selfless. I'm selfish. He's about others. I'm about me. He lived to please the Father. I lived to please myself. Love came natural to him because God is love and Jesus is God the Son and the Son of God. But I had to learn what love was before I can even begin to learn and try to love like Jesus. He's the light of the world. I was of the darkness and lived in darkness. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I was lost deceived and dead in trespasses and sins. Everything in him is good and every good thing in me is him. And I would hope that as I shared those things, you weren't thinking, man, pastor's worse than I thought, but that you were identifying because everything I said was true of me was true of you. And hopefully to a lesser degree, now that we've come to know Jesus and we're walking in his grace and in his light and in his love and in his truth. But it's important that we be honest with ourselves to say, I'm, he's always selfless. I'm still sometimes selfish. He's always right. I'm sometimes wrong. Well, we're going to get a lot of that as we look at Philippians 2 in our study on the mind of Christ. Now in chapter one, we learned that we can overcome our circumstances by seeing everything we endure and everyone we encounter through the lens of eternity. Where did Paul share it? He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's true for every born again believer. Well, the the first should be true We should be living for Christ. If you're in Christ and he's in you, then to die is gain. How so? Because we go from serving him here to standing in his presence, to falling on our feet before him, on our face before him, casting our crowns at his feet, to sing holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty. Paul calls his trials, his tribulations, little things like, arrested, beaten, stripes, rods, stoning, shipwrecks, all of those in multiples, he calls them the things that happened to me. We dwelt on that a little last time, but it's important to say, you know, if, if I was being arrested for what I'm doing or beaten for it, if I was put in jail, if I was, was you know, falsely accused, all the things that happened to him that could have deterred him, that could have derailed him, they didn't. Why? He didn't even see them as obstacles. He saw them as open doors. So if he was in prison, well, he could have a prison ministry. And if he was set free, he could go wherever the Lord led him, as we saw happen in the last chapter. So not obstacles, open doors and doors of opportunity. Therefore, he says here in chapter 2, verse 1, If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection, excuse me, and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, Let each esteem others better than himself, more worthy than ourself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This second word, if, could be translated and should be translated since. 
He's not saying it's possible that it is. He's saying it is a reality. There's consolation in Christ. There's comfort of love. There's fellowship in the spirit. Why didn't it, they just write sense? I don't know. But the Greeks, well, you know what they say. It's all Greek to me. And what we do know is that the original Greek readers, they would have read sense regardless of the, the English word that's here. So I'm filling in that blank for us because it's important to say, while this might not be true for every one of you, it's true for every one of you who are in Christ Jesus. Every one of you who've given your life to the one who died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Every one of you who is growing and flourishing growing in and flourishing for our Lord. Well, what he does is he gives us a series of commands and, and, and he says, Here, here's what I want to see from you. If, if this, these things are yours and they are, he says, I want you to think like Jesus, to be like-minded. Now that's only possible when his thoughts become ours. When the things that happen to us, as Paul shared, we th- we think not just what would Jesus do in this situation, but what does Jesus want me to do? And what might he do through me if I walk in obedience to him? To be like-minded is to have the mind of Christ. Then he says he wants us to love like Jesus, having the same love. You know, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus told those disciples, those he chose and discipled personally and empowered and and sent out to represent him. He, He said, I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. They had experienced something greater than the law of God. And that was the love of God manifested And God, the son, there in the very flesh before him. Love one another the way that I've loved you. Even the law, and this is important to say, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Only Jesus ever did that properly and and continuously. He did always those things that please the father. That's a big thing. And and, and so we don't always do things that please our father. But the more we become like Jesus, the more we think like Jesus, the more we love like Jesus, well, we'll find ourselves loving God and loving people. By the way, I know you've heard it. You can't love others till you learn to love yourself. I would suggest that's not true at all. My problem is I can't love others because I'm too busy loving myself. That, and, and I do believe, while I'm not accusing you of it, I do believe that's true for all of us. We don't need to learn to love us more. That comes natural. How many of you were ever hungry and there's food in the house and you just sit there and say, I wish someone would bring me food. No, you just get up and go get it. But what if your neighbor, when he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, what if he doesn't have any food? What if you find out something's happened and they're, they're destitute? It's just saying, love them the way you love you. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're they're naked, clothe them. Just avert your eyes, but clothe them by all means. And, and, And so whatever you would want for you, whatever you have for you, he's saying you can be like Jesus, who always gave, who always did, who always looked out for the needs of others. To serve like Jesus is to be of one accord. He used the word striving together. And in 127, he spoke of the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To be other-centered is to be of one mind, unified in thought and deed, edifying one another in love. To be selfless like Jesus is seeing myself, my wants, my needs, and my desires, not as my primary concerns, actually to see them as obstacles to overcome. Things that are in my way of fulfilling God's call on my life. My desires, my preferences, my, it it can't be about me. 
if I'm really living for him. And it can't be about you if you're living for him. Listen, remember that, that saying, uh, you know, got to watch out for number one. It, it's actually true. In, in, even in the Christian life, you just want to make sure you're not number one. Watching out for number one means looking for that person after Jesus who's most important to you and you're most important to them. If you're married, that number one is your wife or your husband. If you have kids, well, there are two or three or around here, four or five or six or seven. That, and, and, and the point is to think like Jesus, to have the mind of Christ means to simply look around and say, well, what can I do for those around me? That's how he lived. That's what he's called us to. It's selflessness like Jesus. Again, seeing all those things that used to drive me and motivate me and inspire me to see them as actual obstacles to me accomplishing his will for my life. Listen, Christ-like humility that's what he calls us to in this part as well. And there's a cure for our pride and conceit in simply humbling ourselves before God. Not, not that phony kind of humility where, oh, I'm really not very, or I'm really nothing. Or and Maybe it's not always phony, but it's always wrong. Listen, you are so important to God that he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die for your sins so you could have a relationship with him. How could anyone think, oh, I'm no one or I'm nothing? Well, maybe without Christ, Paul actually does say that, without him, I am nothing. But in him, I can do all things. Through him, I can do all things. So we gotta see ourselves the way he sees us with great potential but not if we're walking after the flesh, not if we're living the same life we would have lived if Jesus wasn't in our life. He's going to give us four examples, beginning with the only perfect example. And the four will be Jesus and Paul, and then Timothy and Epaphroditus. That's the rest of this chapter. Four men, four lives, four examples to us. He starts with Jesus, because, well, he's the prototype. By the way, if you want to know what the person you're married to or hope to marry someday, if you're not yet married, or if you want to know what your kids or your parents or anybody else in your life who's in Christ and Christ lives in them, if you want to know what they're going to be like when they're perfected, all you have to do is look to Jesus. And, and, and I would encourage you not to compare because you'll be like, man, you have so far to go. If you want to do that, you should just compare yourself to Jesus. The Bible says those who compare themselves among one another are not wise. So anyway, Jesus, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He's saying, think like this. The mind of Christ, well, we can, we can absorb him and, and let him lead you know, when I was young, and this was a long time ago, they had like black and white TV and three stations. And, uh, but anyway, back in those days, there were a lot of cartoons. They were actually my favorite because you got the news and then you have a couple shows and then you got cartoons. But there was this cartoon that, that they had a, a, a little devil on one side talking in this ear and a little angel or, you know, on this side talking in this ear, a good, a good angel and a bad angel because, you know, the devil is a fallen angel. And, and the whole idea is that to, to have the mind of Christ, I don't, it's not a, a battle between, you know, the dark angel and the, the, the good angel. It's me just listening for Jesus' voice. For me just praying and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? I found he's really good at directing me if I just set my heart to know his will and to do it. 
So he's saying, you want to think like Jesus? Well, you start by humbling yourself. Why? Because he didn't consider, though he was in the form of God, that something to hang on to. Now, what does it even mean that he was in the form of God? It's simple. He was spirit. In the beginning, before the word became flesh and dwelt among us, before there were any fleshly creatures, there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What form were they in? They were all spirit. Jesus, prior to the, we call it the incarnation, if you're new to this, it's when he took on flesh. But he didn't just appear as a man. No, he was born of, of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. That's important. Because we know that, you know, when somebody says, don't judge me till you've walked in my shoes. God's like actually gotten into the flesh. He was God in the flesh. Call him Emmanuel, God with us. So what we have is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can confirm this, by the way, they worked in perfect unity and creation and salvation, and in our transformation, they, all, they each play a part. But in the very beginning, it was let us make man in our image. Us who? Who's he talking to? Man was made in the image of God, the crown of his creation. It's a discussion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus actually tells us this in John 4 when he says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. He's seeking such to worship him. So, so we worship the, 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 the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Only one of the three took upon himself flesh. Again, not just appearing in flesh, but, but actually born and growing and going through all the things we do. But get this. Elsewhere, we will read that the fullness of the Godhead indwelt Jesus bodily. It wasn't like the Father wasn't with him or the Spirit wasn't with him. They were, they were still working in perfect unity. So you can trace it through. You'll find it to be true. Be a Berean. They were more noble, we read, than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So he's in the form of God, he's spirit, but he didn't consider this something to hang on to. And we know in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's so important because John 1, 14 the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there we have it, his deity, the word was God, and his humanity, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus was in very nature God, sinless, holy, pure, perfect, merciful, just, and every other good thing. But verse 7, and we read it, he made himself of no reputation. What does that mean? He wasn't here to say, hey, check me out. He was here to bring people to faith in him so they could be reconciled to the Father. It was a choice he made, a decision he made. He took the form of a bondservant, that word, and we saw it in our introductory study. It means a servant by choice. He became a servant by choice. He didn't just come and live among us and be an example to us. He was that in every way, but his good example could never save us. It could only point us in the right direction. And then when we tried to do what he wanted us to do, we would realize I just don't have it in me I'm just I'm not like Jesus that's why I started by saying how different I am by nature than Jesus and yet he's making me into someone like him that transformation will be finished when I stand before him in glory well anyway he made himself a bond servant he chose to be a bond servant a servant by choice 
came in the likeness of men, found an appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So here's how this impacts us. His submission is an example for us. Submission is a decision. It's a choice. That's why subjugation and that's what a lot of people think submission is, you know, submitting to one another in love, we read in Ephesians, wives to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Subjugation is somebody making you do something. Submission is you willingly and joyfully doing that very same thing. And what does it really mean? Putting the other first, seeing them as more more important than you see yourself, more uh, needy than you see yourself. So his submission, well, there's a picture there for us. Um, his form, his likeness appearance as a man, already shared it. The word became flesh. Jesus really became one of us. Some of the early church fathers, they, they logged it and got it right. Fully God and fully man. And we'll see in a moment where it'll talk about God and it'll talk about Jesus. Whenever that happens in scripture, God, the God being referenced there, well, it's the father. Why? Because the father sent the son. And, and so the son is still submitted to the father. He submitted all the way to the point of the cross, humbling himself, being obedient to who? To the father to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And by the way, that deal was struck before the creation of the world. You were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Not just to get to heaven, but to be holy and blameless before him in love. There was a covenant between father and son that Jesus would come and reconcile man before Adam and Eve ever sinned. Why? Because he knew what would happen. And don't come up and ask me, well, why did he still create them? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. If he knew how hard it would be to make us the people we're supposed to be, maybe he just likes a challenge. But, but I, in all honesty, I can't fully explain or fully comprehend it. I just know that's what the scripture says. And I believe it because he says it. The picture of, um, you know, his likeness appearing as a man. Do you know that Jesus shows up in the Old Testament prior to the incarnation in the New Testament? He shows up, but he was not yet a man. He just appeared. Angels appeared as if they were men. But there's a difference. And so, um, humble and obedient. Listen, Jesus suffered unimaginable pain not just on the cross, from the scourging, from the beating. They blindfolded him and blindsided him, mocking, saying, hey, you're a prophet, tell us who's hitting you. He put up with all that, and then he went to the cross and prayed for those people. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Humble and obedient. He bore our sins on the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them, as I just shared. By the way, that day, two of three guilty sinners went free. The first was a guy named Barabbas. He was scheduled for crucifixion. They had three crosses ready to go. Actually, three poles, and then they would go out bearing that, this part, and it would be, you know, nailed to the other or fitted into it. But Barabbas was supposed to be crucified. He was guilty and Rome had judged him so. But Jesus was supposed to go free. And Pilate did all he could. He said, I find him not guilty. He's totally innocent. Why? What has he done when they cried for his crucifixion? And they didn't say what he'd done. They just said, crucify him. But get this. Barabbas goes free because Jesus takes his place on the cross. Did he later give his life to the Lord? I don't know. I hope he did. I hope he understood what just happened and appreciated if he hung around and who knows, appreciated what Jesus prayed. Forgive them, all of them. 
and they know not what they do. There was another, two thieves were nailed to crosses on either side of him. And though both started by mocking him, one of them changed his mind somewhere along the line. And he said, Lord, calling him who he is, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response and reply to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wherever Jesus was after death, that thief was going to be too. And he didn't call it hell, he called it paradise. He was in the ground, we know that, because it says that, that he would be, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of fish, so would the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Anyway, those went free because Jesus paid for them, because Jesus set them free. Therefore, we read in verse 9, God also has ex highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. What's that name? Jesus. It's why when we sing it, it it's something happens in us. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth. Listen, these are the only three places someone can be, either in heaven or on the earth, or under the earth. You don't want to end up under the earth, not just in the dirt, but under it. In any case, everyone in hell, everyone on earth, and everyone in heaven is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I remember somebody saying, and I'm happy to repeat it to you, beat the rush, do it now. Do it today. We'll give you an opportunity to give your life to the one who gave his life for you, who died for your sins, was buried and rose again, who had you in mind when he said, Father, forgive him, not just those he could see, but he could see through all these, all these years and, and decades and centuries and, and beyond. So all of that to say, we should humble ourselves today. We should bend our knee today. We should bow and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 12 goes on to say, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always observed, not only in my presence or not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Listen, religion without a relationship with Jesus is all about working for salvation. And I've heard people actually say you've got to work for salvation. It doesn't say that. It says work out your salvation. You can't work out something you don't have. And, and so most of us are familiar with the concept clearly not all of us engaging in it, and uh, of working out so that you could be stronger physically, so you could build the muscle mass that's, well, the muscles are there on your body. And some of you, it's clear that you're working out, or God just made you a hulk. But, you know, some of us, we were thin and skinny and little. He took care of that problem too. But, but still, still short, still little, but no longer skinny. And, and so... The point is, we all have muscles, and if you don't use them, if you don't work them, well, they won't grow. You won't be healthy. And if you've ever been wounded or had a serious injury, and many of us have had something like that at one point, man, you, you, they, if, you, they, if you're laid up for a week or more, your body starts to atrophy. You can't just get out of bed and run. You can hardly walk. And so I had some very bad injury on my lower back and I did months of physical therapy just to get back to where I could walk around and, and and you know enjoy life as much as possible and I worked hard because I wanted the freedom of being able to get around again but but he's saying now that you have this gift of salvation you need to work it out you need to exercise yourself to godliness I love that that, you know, those concepts just fit so 
beautifully together. So uh, again, we're not working for our salvation. We're not even working because we're saved, but we're, we're working for him because he first worked for us. We're serving him because he first served us and gave his life for us. So do all things. Oh, that God works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's so important. Don't think I caught it first service. That happens to me sometimes. But, but know this, that, that he actually gives you the will to do his will. I remember this when I was a very young Christian. I, I, I just had a lot of bad habits. I got rid of the big ones early on. But I love to just, you know, veg. I was a musician, so I worked nights until I got the Disneyland gig. Then I worked days, and that was just like, yes, so good. But, um, but anyway, I used to just sit around and watch TV, and, and I smoked stuff that was bad for you. And it wasn't cigarettes. Cigarettes are really bad. I, when they wrote that on there that, you know, the Surgeon General said this could, you know, be really bad, I said, well, I'm not smoking that anymore. But nobody told me about the other stuff. I don't know if they have labels on it now because I don't use it. But my point is I had a lifestyle of just getting stoned with my friends when they came over. And we just sit around and watch games or whatever was on TV. And, and, and here's, here's the whole thing. That lifestyle, I, I had to pray at one point and say, God, would you just give me the will to do your will, I must have read this because I don't know what would have led me to ever pray such a thing. I knew that I needed a change and people were telling me, we had some friends once who told us Christians can't smoke pot. And I'm like, well, that's funny because we're Christians and we're smoking it. And so, but I was that dumb and that naive. And they should have told me Christians shouldn't smoke pot. That I believe even today. Oh, but it's legal. Yeah, lots of stuff's legal doesn't mean we should do it all. I mean, there's tons of stuff that's legal and are an abomination to God. And so I don't want to use any excuse to do something that feeds the part of me that had too much of me, my flesh. Because you feed your flesh, you're going to just grow more fleshly. You feed the spirit, he's going to dominate your life. So it's God working in us to will, to want to do his will. I think it led me into the word in a way I couldn't have imagined. Because do you know that if you have a habit, something you do with all your friends every time you see them, and you stop doing it, pretty soon you won't see them. If it's the reason they're coming over, so something has to replace that. There's a, a, a big hole in your life if all of your, your um, interaction with people revolves around drinking or smoking or watching this or doing that. And so if you stop, well, pretty soon you're just there without them. And what God showed me is I just need to get in the word. So I'm like, God, give me a hunger for your word so I have something that I'm craving the way I craved all that. And you know what's great? He did that. He does that. When we ask for that which is perfect in his sight, listen, if we ask anything according to his will, we know we have the petition we've made of him. So the key is, is this your will? You know he says that we need to be in the word. You know he says we need to walk in the spirit. You know he says we need to walk in love. We need to walk in truth. We need to walk in the light. We don't have to say, is any of that your will? It's all his will. So, Lord, give us the will today to do your will. Then he shares something that we really probably don't even need to spend any time on. It says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Anybody here think there's any reason to consider that? Actually, there is. The servant of the Lord is told not to quarrel, in case you don't know what disputing is. Complaining, it's so rare. And, uh, of course, you know, a lot of people complained a lot during COVID. It's not like we're through it. We're just over it, right? It's around, but we're done. And, and, and the point is, COVID didn't make us complainers. It just revealed that we had hearts like that. Because people who complain all the time, they're just revealing their heart. And if you're like, well, that's harsh, pastor. No, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what the scripture says. 
So if you're always complaining, something's at wrong and it's inside. And so he's saying we're to do all things without complaining and without disputing, without arguing, that you may be blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. So I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Listen, the offerings there in Leviticus, and that's where this comes from. Those of you who read through the Bible every year or try, you know, you start in Genesis and there's a lot of great action and it's easy to follow the story, you know, because after the first 11 chapters, it's one family, four generations. But, but then you get to, to Exodus and that's pretty good too. There's all kinds of miracles and all kinds of great things going on. Then it's Leviticus. And man, it bogs down. It's hard reading. And as a very young Christian, I heard a guy on the radio named J. Vernon McGee. Some of you know who he is. He is the only not non-Calvary Chapel pastor on our radio station. We're on seven days a week, play all day long. Great teachers, because I got to pick all my favorites. But, but I chose him because he unlocked things for me in a way no one else ever did. And one of the things he said, when you're in a passage and it just seems difficult and laborsome and you're not getting it, he said, just put Jesus right in the middle of it. And I did that in Leviticus. And all of a sudden, the burn offering and the sin offering and the, the drink offering and the fellowship offering, all of those just came alive because I could see how they pointed to Jesus. That, that revelation led me to my series, Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And, and I go through each book. Well, a couple of them like Genesis, two, two weeks on it. But I, I go through them in, in one study. It's available on our app, on the website. Encourage you to check it out. If you've never had anything that took you from Genesis to Revelation in like 60 eight, 69 studies, I'd encourage you to go through that series. And, and what happens, especially in those weird Old Testament parts, you, it, you just see Jesus there. It's like, why did God let this happen? Or what's going on here? Or why would he say that? Or, and all of a sudden, the lights go on, literally, and, uh, as we follow the light of the world and, and see him everywhere we look. So he goes on to mention us being lights, not only blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Latter part of verse 15. Let your light so shine, Jesus said, before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're not doing good work so men will applaud us or approve us or think more of us. We're doing them because they see him when we're living out who he says we are. He said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows after me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then he says, now you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine that they see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. I love that. In the Old Testament, it says that, that uh, those who were wise will, will bring many souls to, to, to salvation. Those who were wise will win souls and, and shine as the, like the stars of the heavens. Well, anyway, no more complaining, no more arguing, now blameless and harmless, faultless, because he's made it so shining as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason. You also be glad and rejoice with me. I know I read it to you, but I wanted to get it all in context. He goes from using Jesus as the ultimate example to using himself 
And Paul elsewhere says something few of us would ever say. Follow me as I follow Christ. Why wouldn't we say it? Where we'd be authorizing them, just follow me around. You want to know what a Christian is? You want to see how Jesus operates in the life of a Christian? Just hang out with me. Listen, few of us want to do that, right? It's, it's like because we're not always kind. We're not always merciful. We're not always forgiving. We're not always obedient. So we live in a neighborhood, by the way. There's a little park behind our house, and then there's a finger of a lake near, nearby. And, and there's something about the water. It's probably why Jesus liked teaching on it, you know, although I, the waves would be a problem, and just the environment. But anyway, that's another thing. Um, but, but anyway, the phone rings. I mean, we're sitting on our back porch. The phone rings at a house three, three doors down, but across the park and down the lake, three doors down, and we can hear the person answering their phone. I look at Pam, and her eyes are big, and mine too, because we just realized they can hear us too. And and. It's like to say, just follow me. I want to be able to say that. You want to know what Jesus is like, what the Christian life is at its ultimate? Don't we all want to be able to say, just follow me? But I'm still working on that and, and surrendering things that I didn't even know were a problem. But all of that to say, Paul could say it, and I want to be able to say it. And I want you to be able to say it. He deals with Timothy and Epaphroditus last. And we'll get through them rather quickly. Timothy means two things. Dear to God and one who honors God. I like that. If your name's Timothy, the Bible says, well, Timothy means dear to God. Now listen, that's true for all of us. Whatever your name is, you're dear to God. But one who honors God? That can and should be, but isn't necessarily. Paul, well, he calls Timothy his son in the faith. And like Paul, he loved and served Jesus by loving and serving people. An example to all of us. He is using these guys, Jesus himself, Timothy, and Epaphroditus to say, here's four people that you can kind of model after. And he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. So he's saying, listen, I only have one guy here that I can send to you right now that I know will rightly represent the Lord. Paul had a lot of people visit him in prison. He had a lot of people who loved him, provided for him, prayed for him. But at this point, most had deserted him. He'd, Epaphroditus had been sent by the Philippians to him. He'll mention him last. But Timothy was there and he says, I got to send him because I want you to have somebody who I know thinks like Jesus, who has the mind of Christ, and it's there. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. And then he says, what gets in the way? All seek their own, not the things that are of Christ Jesus. So, but you, he says, you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once. As soon as I see how it goes with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. It's doubtful that that faith, that hope, that confidence was rewarded because history says Paul never got out of his second Roman incarceration. Uh, he did ultimately, uh, it came to an end, and he would have immediately been in the presence of God, but it came to a, a brutal and bitter end. But his hope at this part, he's saying, I'm trusting in the Lord, and he means I'm hoping that I will be able to come to you shortly. Epaphroditus, he's last. His name means two things, charming and devoted to Aphrodite. Now, that's for sure his parents, right? I mean, he, nobody names themselves. And, and, and so charming, I like that. Epaphroditus, but you hear it, that Didus part, right? 
devoted to Aphrodite. That means his folks were, were idol worshipers. And Aphrodite, one of the, the, the worst of the worst. They're, all the idols are bad, but she was a mess. And uh, anyway, he says, I considered it necessary to send to you, verse 25, Epaphroditus, my brother. He's saying he's family. Family to me, family to you. Fellow worker, that's a partner in ministry. Fellow soldier, that's a partner in spiritual warfare. But your messenger, he's reminding them, they sent him to him. And, and, and so messenger here is an apostle, not one of the A team, the apostles, but anyone sent out, well, that it's like our, our ambassadors, and that's what he was. He was sent from them to minister to Paul. Now Paul's sending him back to them to minister to them. And he says, the one who ministered to my need, he was a servant. All of these tell us what we need to be and what we are if we're in Christ Jesus. We're family. We're partners in ministry with him and with one another in spiritual warfare. And we're sent to serve. Since he was longing for you all and distressed because you had heard he was sick, I would indeed, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. A couple things related to this verse, and then there's just another couple, and I have something for you to take home and chew on. One of the things I get out of this, and, and it's there, is that our faithfulness cannot guarantee health or wealth or comfort or ease. In fact, the opposite is true. He was sick, by the way, at one point. Paul, that is. Timothy was sick. He, he suffered. Epaphroditus was sick, and they'd heard about it. So, so there are those teaching that, hey, Christ suffered so we don't have to suffer. That's not what the scripture says. He died so we don't have to die. We don't have to be separated from the Father forever because we're guilty sinners. He died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Forgiveness and life is in him. So, so here's the thing when people say, well, he died so you don't have to. Okay, but suffered? suffering is a part of walking with the Lord and living for the Lord. Our faithfulness cannot guarantee health or wealth or comfort or ease. No. Paul was gifted to heal, but he couldn't heal himself. He couldn't heal Timothy. He couldn't heal Epaphroditus. Why? Because if we ask anything according to his will, his being the Lord, we know he hears us. And if he hears us, we know we have the petition we've made. What happens when I ask for something that's not the will of God? I don't get it. He just says no. Or sometimes he says, just wait a while. And I'm like, how long? But the, the point is that, that, that he no doubt prayed for himself. We know he did. We've seen it. He prayed three times that the, the, the thorn would pass from him, that the suffering he endured would come to an end. And God said, hey, my grace is sufficient. My, my strength's made perfect in your weakness. And so he prays for Timothy, but Timothy doesn't get better either. And he prays for Epaphroditus, and, and he doesn't get better either. Either, Excuse me. So that's what he's saying, sick almost to death. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Listen, I have something for you to consider. In conclusion, something to consider and chew on. And it's, well, has to do with our service. You know that Jesus is the ultimate servant. He humbled himself and became a bond servant, servant by his decision and choice. But he served every person he ever came in contact with in one way or another. And so here's, here's what I, I see when it comes to service. Some serve only themselves and they, some have others serve them. Some serve whenever and wherever they're needed and whoever is in need. So, my question to you would be, which of these describes Christ? 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Did he serve himself? No. Did he, did he have others serve him? No. He said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He was one who served whenever and wherever needed and whoever was in need. So we know which describes Jesus best. The question I'd have you spend a little time chewing on is which best describes you. Lord, we're so grateful for the work you've begun and that you've promised that you will complete it. You didn't get us started and leave us on our own to become the people you want to see us become. You began a good work and you'll be faithful to complete it. So Lord, we know our part is to simply let you have your way. You don't really need our assistance in transforming us. You just need us to cease the resistance to all you want to do in us and through us. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that, that you'll just wash over them, just bless them, pour your spirit upon them in wondrous and, and, and transformative ways. Do something unexpected in every heart, in every home, in every workplace, in every school place, in every place we recreate. Do something that is so clearly and obviously you that people will take note and give you the glory. And then, Lord, we want to unite in prayer that if there'd be any or many here this hour, this service, or in the overflow or in the cafe or logged on or listening in, if there'd be any who've yet to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Remember me, Lord. Forgive me my sin. Be my Lord and my Savior. You died so I could live. Lord, I want to live. Not just eternally, though I want that. I want to live abundantly now. So if you've never given your life to him, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. And I'd ask you to do two simple things. First, raise your hand and keep it up for a moment until I acknowledge you. And then look up and catch my eye. Why both? Because I want to make sure you're not just stretching or doing something like that. But you are making a decision right now. And if you're like, well, no, I'm, I'm on the fence on this whole thing. There is no fence. You're either dead in trespasses and sin or you are alive forever in him. You're dead or alive. And he's saying, I can give you life and I'll do it now. And I'm imploring you, encouraging you to, to take this offer. There's no plan B for your salvation. There's no other name under heaven, whereby we may be saved. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you will do that, either this side of, of death or the other side. And if you never give your life to him, you'll stand before him and hear, depart from me. Give your life to him, you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Your choice, your decision. Anyone this hour, let me see your hand. And we'll pray together. Lord, we're searching for hands. You're searching hearts. You know what keeps us. You know what hinders. You know what's in the way. I pray you'd move those obstacles, Lord. Remove those obstacles that none here would perish but that all would come to repentance. We thank you for loving us first, for loving us perfectly, for loving us still. And we pray you'd have your way. Run after those, pursue those still in the valley of decision, and then have your way in our lives as well. In Jesus' name, and all agreed by saying, amen. Hey,